All right, so for our learning objectives, we are trying to gain a better understanding of how to apply risk and farm site characterization to levees, recognize what type of features to look for when evaluating risk on levees, and gain a better understanding of how a risk assessment can inform future actions to levy owners. That'll be towards the end of the presentation. So our outline, we're gonna go through just the general project overview, um, go through the site characterization and geomorphology of Hartford Levy, uh, the risk assessment, and that, that, that'll be pretty brief, but kind of going over one of our risk drivers and how it informed a risk redu reduction measure review that we did to help the sponsor and uh, any conclusions and questions. So starting with a project overview. So Hartford, I'll just point um, down here on the map. It's on the Connecticut River. The Connecticut River is um, extends from Canada to Long Island Sound and the largest watershed in New England. Um, and Hartford's the state capital of Connecticut. So the project overview, and this is a busy figure in uh, the presentation, and you don't have to get all the information from it, but really just to show that when you're evaluating levees, it's a little different than evaluating dams. You have to break up the levee into different sections and try to um, determine reaches to be able to evaluate it because of the length of the levee. Um, this levee is shorter compared to a lot of other levees, um, just over seven miles, but you still have to break that up and uh, be able to inform your risk as you look at different reaches and kind of determine um, worst case scenarios for those. But for Hartford, the system is divided into four sections. So in the northern section, it's the North Meadows Dyke. Um, that is that upper portion. Um, the stationing is also, that's important to understand for not just levees, but dams as well. In Hartford, the, the stationing is different for each reach or for each section. So it can be confusing. So determining uh, a standard that the team is going to work on on a stationing system and making sure everybody understands what that is is important up front so you don't cause confusion down the road. Um, but the second section is the Hartford Dyke. That's kind of the downtown main area there. It used to be called the Riverfront Dyke. Um, the Clark Dyke, or the now known as South Meadows Dyke, and the Folly Brook Dyke is the southern end, uh, a little small portion of that. Um, it's common for levees. Each levy was constructed under different contracts. It's common for levees to have uh, interesting construction histories and different um, levels of levy <laughs> that you can have. Um, there's also more components to levees. So the, in this one, there's pump stations, closure st structures, pressure conduits, and then um, understanding the penetrations through the levee is really important. Um, primarily for CLE, but also other failure modes. So having a log of all the different um, penetrations through the levee or near the levee and the risk assessment is important. So this is just showing the early levee construction history. So there was a long history of flooding prior to the construction of the existing levee. We'll show some figures of that. The two levee systems that predated the existing system are the Clark Dyke and the Colt Dyke. So here's that flood of 1936, one of the two floods that uh, caused the Corps to come in and construct those levees later on. But devastating floods occurred in 1936 and 1938, uh, resulting in significant damage. Um, the, the, they were the two highest floods of record um, on the Connecticut River through Hartford. The original Clark Dyke and the Colt Dyke were constructed, constructed prior to this, but as you see here, um, some were overtopped. The existing levee system uh, now was constructed following that to, to kind of try to prevent this um, from happening. Here's the 1938 flood. So the levee would have been constructed along here. You can see that the land side is flooded through there. Um, go forward here. Same thing, so the South Meadows um, levee now exists through kind of through here. 
North Meadows, I think this is looking south, kind of goes through here. This is where that levee is now. And then downtown Hartford, you can see is flooded. Um, the levee system now is through here. All right, getting into site characterization. So first approaching site characterization for any project, but um, for this project was looking at the regional scale first, understanding what happened regionally um, is important for kind of digging into that local geology. Otherwise you might circle back a little bit. So um, due to a failed rift basin uh, in the Mesozoic right here, the, the Connecticut Valley was formed um, because of that failed rift basin, allowing sediments to accumulate and then turn into sedimentary rocks. Sedimentary rocks aren't really actually that common in New England, but this is an interesting area. When I got assigned to this project, I was excited to see some in the region. Um, but the influence that as well is, uh, Tom talked about it yesterday with North Springfield, but Glacial Lake Hitchcock is a, a big driver for us to look at along the Connecticut River. So it was a glacial dam that caused uh, a glacial lake along the Connecticut River Valley. You can see here, it extended to Burke, Vermont, down just south of Hartford Levee. That's right around here. So that really is kind of our regional scale, understanding the um, geologic setting of the region and why we're seeing what we're seeing um, in this region. All right. All right. So then looking at the regional and local geology, kind of not quite to the site geology yet and what we have at the project specifically, but generally what, what are we looking at? So you want to look at bedrock and uh, quaternary geology maps to kind of get a better feel for what's there. Um, in the region, glacial till typically blankets the bedrock in, in this area. It can range from 15 to 40 feet thick. Um, glacial lacustrine and glacial fluvial deposits are present here, including some barbed clay, so it's the Hartford clay, and that was formed during that glacial Lake Hitchcock. Barbed clay is typically buried beneath alluvial deposits and a lot of urban fill, as you can imagine, being in Hartford. Um, there's actually something really interesting we found, actually, when the H&H &H team member was looking at um, the river flow and found a damming effect just south of the project, wondering why this happened at a certain flow. And actually the, the sedimentary rock um, kind of turns into a, a crystalline rock a little bit further south, which causes that damming effect. So the geology even helped inform some of the H&H &H and explained how at certain flows, we would th then get a damming effect and, and the river loading would change because of that. So it was something a little interesting um, that I, I didn't expect until the H&H &H person came up and, and asked what was going on. So another good thing um, that you can do, uh, Justin I think hit on this too, is do some historic searches of land use. So looking at um, not just uh, area photos, although those are very important too, but looking at kind of any information you can get. So I had stumbled upon this here, this um, historic map of Weathersfield, Connecticut. And there was a lot of information on here that was super useful in uh, determining what the site geology was. So the, I put stars next to things that kind of reference the river and some of it's um, across the river, but it's still applicable. And you could also, they, they included this map about the river path prior to the, I think it's the 1692 flood. So that kind of helps you figure out where the channel used to be and what you might find along your levee alignment. Um, another interesting one is here. It says the river floods every year, but um, let me kind of hard to read. But its path changed dramatically when around 1700 and ice dam collapsed. So that's important information to understand that this used to flood all the time every year. So you, it might help you inform what kind of deposits you have in that area. So some of these cartoonish maps can also be um, helpful. This was, you know, just to the public. I, uh, uh, like I said, I found it probably doing a, a Google search um, that was, it gave me a lot of information about what I might find along that alignment. 
All right, so getting into site geology and geomorphology. So the Connecticut River has historically been a meandering river um, with different depositional features. There's oxbows, paleo channels, those meander scrolls and point bars that Justin was talking about. Um, the si system crosses several former river and stream channels. And identifying locations of paleo channels is useful in evaluating risk because those paleo channels are often filled with clean, sandy deposits that have higher permeability and may be more susceptible to internal erosion. So a lot of the times when you're doing this, you're looking for the, the site geology, but you're also keeping in the back of your mind how it informs your risk and what that means for, for that system. Uh, most of the potential complications that could have been related to geomorph on this project have been eliminated by the installation of a sheet pile cutoff wall. We'll talk about that more a little bit. But through here, um, you can see different uses of different types of maps. So there's just, um, I think this is just Google Earth, kind of giving the outline of the levee, um, understanding and calling out some deposits or some features that you see. And um, going back into Google Earth, so going back in time and looking at older photos are also helpful. Um, looking at drawings, so there were swamps noted and a, a Hartford general plan. Looking at LIDAR, that can help point out features that maybe you don't recognize in an aerial photo, but they pop out when you're looking at LIDAR. And then oxbows. Um, this was on that last map, that, that historic map of Weathersfield. Um, but it, you can see it obviously here as well. But understanding where your levee alignment is with relation to these. Um, I always draw whatever my dam or levee alignment is on any of the, the maps that I'm looking at, so I have a reference. All right. Let's see here. So this is just kind of extending into um, looking at those features a little bit more in detail and looking at some um, different features. So these are, this is a 1934 aerial photograph. And you can kind of see these better after development. Sometimes it's harder to see. Um, so it's important to look quite a bit backward to be able to see different features and, and as well as what they mapped during construction or pre-construction. So on that previous photo or that previous slide, there was that lighter that showed that paleo channel or where the river used to be. Now that kind of pointed it out a little bit more when you went back to the, the photos and looked at those. But really looking for these types of features like these meander scrolls um, and seeing, okay, well, they kind of, you know, they're, they're migrating, but is there a chance that those go underneath the levee and what does that mean for our risk? All right, so getting into more of uh, site geology. And this profile is actually along, um, I think it's, yeah, it's along I-91. So this is not along the levee, but you can see where um, they call out the levee on this for some fill, but this is kind of a good representation of what's in the area. So there were hundreds of subsurface explorations that were performed along the levee system. Uh, the bedrock is Portland Arcos. It's, really only present, it's mostly deeply buried, but present kind of in the northern and uh, southern ends of the levee system. There was glacial till encountered in most borings that, um, that they, where they were deep enough to reach till, and that typically, as you see here, thinly blankets the uh, bedrock. Mm -hmm. There's layers of unconsolidated glacial lacustrine deposits, it's that barbed clay, um, that Hartford clay, that was pretty, um, pretty loose material. Uh, some of the SPTs were weight of rod or up to 12 blows per foot, but that told us a lot as well. And that had the potential to be sensitive, so meaning the strength can be lost when it's disturbed. And then there's alluvium deposits that overlie those uh, varved clays where the varved clays do exist. And then a lot of urban fill that I talked about earlier, just due to it being in an, uh, a city. Yep. What is varved? Varved, that's a good question. So varved clay is, it's um, really cool. 
<laughs> so there's layers and you can see the layers they're they're based on seasonal changes so you'll get a, a coarser material um then with a finer material on top of it so maybe more of a silt or, or clay on top of it and that's due to the amount of movement on seasonal changes so and when there's a lot of runoff or flow you'll get those coarser deposits that are laid down and then when it slows down then you'll get those finer deposits on top and then they just are sequenced and that they actually use that it's tufts that has a pretty um big log of these clays in the region um they kind of go up and down the connecticut river valley but you can go and dig them and you can see you know years so they they log them because it's a, a cycle of a year or whatever that for that region but here yep yeah good question All right, so getting into the risk assessment, this will be um, kind of an abbreviated look at the risk assessment. But I wanna show how we used it to kind of inform future actions to some extent. So these were our risk drivers for the Hartford levee. It was overtopping, collapse of abandoned structures. So that's where that penetrations list comes in really helpful or, or uh, and you can not just look at the structures that are perpendicular or that go under the levee, but those just adjacent to the levee if they have the potential to create a void space, which in this case, there was a, there could be a potential for a void space to be um, just at the toe of the levee. So that was one we evaluated. And when you're doing that, um, there's a lot of potentials that you can have. So you kind of have to figure out where your worst case scenario would be or that this would be the highest risk. Um, and then backward embankment through seepage and backward erosion piping through the foundation. This is really what kind of initiated part of the risk assessment was this concern from the city about, um, about BEP through that foundation. All right. So this is just kind of uh, showing a, a failure pathway. So out of the several um, sand samples that were um, sent in, there were um, several of them had a, a CU of six or less with an average of 4.1 and a minimum of 1.7, which is pretty low. Um, and then the, we had to go through, if I go back actually one more, you can see, so this isn't how we broke up the levee system and reaches, but this is, these were different, um, these are different reaches within one section of the levee to be able to kind of determine, okay, where could we have VEP? Where is it most likely? It's the most susceptible and kind of doing a screening. It takes a little bit longer sometimes because you have to screen a lot more. You first screen your failure modes, but then you have to screen locations as well to try to figure out where you need to focus your um, energy. So this is just showing the, the sketch of that failure pathway. So you have the riverside. So instead of upstream, downstream, we have riverside, landside. So the riverside, the Connecticut River here, loading the flood wall in this case. Um, and there's some SPSW in the foundation. And we had determined that there could be two exit locations, potentially one through a railroad tunnel and another through the highway. So um, most of the levee system was designed with this continuous sheet pile cutoff wall. It mostly penetrated into that barbed clay deposit, but not in all areas, um, just due to the depth. And when you don't extend sometimes into those um, non-pervious areas, then, or those, yeah, those impervious areas, then you, uh, you can lengthen the seepage path link to where it may no longer be a concern. So if you don't extend it there, usually try to, trying to extend it to a point where the seepage path is too long for you to think that there's going to be an issue, um, that does happen. Uh, there's this Bulkley Bridge right here that, uh, that was founded in soil with no cutoff wall installed beneath, leaving a window for BEP. So that was pre-existing. It was difficult to be able to construct that around, so there was a window. Also, in a lot of levee systems, there's been a lot of modifications done in the area, especially in a city. 
So um, not all construction documents were available when we were doing the risk assessment. Uh, DOT is usually <laughs> kind of difficult to get information on. So when these um, highways go in or things change, sometimes we have to make assumptions and uh, estimates on what there is. And uh, the pisometer, there were some pisometers in here, and they had nearly instantaneous um, responses to the river. But ultimately, when you're in a city like this, it's a complex system. There's a lot of moving parts um, that you have to take into account. So just jumping into some of the more and less likely factors, these, this isn't all of them, but it's kind of just showing some of the things that we thought were more and less likely for BEP. So we're more likely that, like I just said, the piezometers reacted instantaneously with the river. Um, we had some low CU sands, which is a concern for BEP. There were numerous penetrations that you could uh, provide an, an unfiltered exit to on the land side. Um, and seepage pressures may be sufficient to blow through. There's a low perme permeability blanket uh, beneath the highway, and there's a chance that those seepage pressures may be high enough to blow through that. Less likely is the loading, um, luckily here. So critical loading was near top of levee, which was relatively infrequent for a levee system. There was no poor performance to date. The uniform sand layer has at least 15 feet of lower permeability alluvial soils and urban fill above it, which so on the more likely we have that you could have these vertical penetrations that provide an unfiltered exit. But assuming that those don't provide that, there's a lot of overburden that you have to go through or fill that you have to go through to get um, to get to the surface. There may not have been enough fines content to hold the roof and the seepage pressures may not be high enough at the railroad corridor. So looking at those two different locations and um, kind of evaluating them together. Like I said, this wasn't a full list. We had a pretty extensive list, but this is kind of a sampling of what we looked at. So um, going into it, one of the goals was to do this SQRA, kind of understand BEP and any other failure modes that we had and then brief those results to the sponsor, um, is the city of Hartford in this case. And they were going to develop risk reduction measures and we were gonna work through those as well. So the approach for the risk assessment was to help the city understand the risk with the levy system in general. And then look at the potential risk reduction to any uh, proposed risk reduction measures that they would implement. So they provided us with what they thought they might do. They provided us with structural and non-structural risk assessments, the risk reduction measures to um, use our risk assessment to inform. And then we met with representatives from the city and their consultants to discuss those. I'll go over those on the next slide here. So uh, on the next slide, I'll show you a little bit more on these structural measures, but um, we looked at the potential for a positive cutoff for the under seepage um, and these are just the BEP ones. Oh, thank you. These are just the BEP ones. There were other ones for other failure modes as well, but just focusing on this one that um, was a concern for the city going into it um, was to install this positive cutoff wall, um, install relief wells on the landslide to intercept that seepage, or install horizontally drilled relief wells um, because it's in a city, so it's a little challenging for constructing anything. Some of the non-structural measures for all failure modes were public outreach, uh, an EAP communication, um, what, um, monitoring plans during high river flows, and piezometer installation and monitoring. Oh, keep pressing the wrong one. All right, so getting into those structural measures, these were kind of some of the factors that we weighed when we looked at those. So installing a positive cutoff cuts off that potential for BEP, um, but there, it may be challenging because of the infrastructure in the area. So you have that railroad embankment, you have a highway, you have, you're in a city, and then you also have that bridge that causes some issues and, and uh, could be challenging to construct a cutoff wall in. So we're looking at vertical relief walls. 
there's potential contamination in the soil and groundwater. So that's an added um, requirement to look at if you're pumping up water from the foundation, how are you going to treat that water or soil? And that was a concern for long-term maintenance um, for those relief wells. Similar to a horizontal relief well, that would be challenging, um, but putting, it was brought up because of the, the infrastructure in the area would make vertical relief walls somewhat challenging to get the, the area to be able to do that. So these horizontal ones, they thought if they came in with a horizontal uh, directional drilling that they may be able to provide some relief well that way. But there were similar concerns with treatment of doing that and how you would, um, how you would finish and be able to build a filter on that. And then non-structural measures, those would reduce consequences for all PFMs. So in general, there were a lot of challenges with construction methods due to it being an urban setting, and they're all costly measures because of that. But in the end, we gave what we thought a risk reduction for these types of measures would be, and it was up to the sponsor to decide what they would move forward with and what they were willing to do to reduce the risk of their system. But at least at this point, they had a better understanding of what the risk was. And that the, the risk for BEP actually lowered. So we went into it and the city went into it with this large concern of BEP. Um, overtopping ended up being a higher risk and some other failure modes. So it actually, the city was ready to put a lot of um, work into building these because they thought it was the, the largest concern, but it helped shift maybe some of their recommendations and some of their measures to some other things that were actually driving the risk that wasn't previously understood. All right, so for a knowledge check, um, what are some features you might look for when evaluating risk at a levy? Pathway. Yes. Thank you. Anybody else? Issues. Yep. What kind of geomorphology? You can go to if it wasn't. Yep. Yep. What about um, how would you find that information? Yay. <laughs> Anything else? Documentation of old river alignments, um, geology, geologic maps. Yep. Cool. Under built structures, like if you get DOT information. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep. That's really important. Challenging, but important. Okay, so key takeaways, um, recognizing what features to look for, um, risk-informed site characterization for levies is necessary to develop risk reduction measures, that applies to dams as well, um, and close coordination with the levy owners or sponsors is important, so they were in the room with us, it was actually really great to have them there, their consultants were in the room with us when we did the risk assessment, and that helped them understand how we got there, so we're not just briefing them at the end, um, and why we got there, and gave the input on any performance that we had questions on or any operations and maintenance that we had questions on. And we looked at closure structures a lot. They were able to answer, you know, what they would do, and so you you wouldn't have to assume what they would do. You could ask them what they would do. So having them in the room is really important. Are there any questions? Yes. How, how did you deal with uncertainty in terms of, like, were there, were there any data gaps or items where you thought you could have done more physical uh, explorations? I think there's always, you always want more, but um, you have to, it depends on the level of risk assessment too. So when you're doing an SQRA, you kind of just use the information you have rather than gaining additional information and you make assumptions and you document those assumptions. So, um, yeah, there were areas that there's uncertainty, you know, if there's 
there were a lot of borings, but the understanding kind of, you know, even where the sheet pile wall was completely at, not at, and what the condition of that was, um, you just have to make assumptions and document those as best as you can. And then if it was justified or if you were able to go to a higher level and you then use that to inform how you could improve those data gaps and what data you would gather and how that would inform your risk. I actually don't. I think they're still working through it. Um, I don't know the answer. What they just if they've done anything yet? I mean, I think I know that they've been working. So I previously worked in New England district, and um, the actually the levy safety program manager of the district worked on this risk assessment before he took that role. But I don't know what uh, where they're at right now with it. Um, I, I think they're still working through things, but I don't know if anything permanent has been put into place at this point. No, I'm getting it's still being planned. But ultimately, I mean, it was it was viewed as a hugely successful project to be able to steer, you know, kind of steer them in the direction of risk reduction and not just a perception. Yeah. Elsewhere, and then the risk actually save them. Yeah, so yeah, they were going to spend the money putting in something for these um, for BEP, whether that was relief walls, and I think they were ready to do that. And we were able. It's kind of it was early in the time when we started doing these higher level risk assessments for levies. Um, it was one of the first ones to kind of go through that process, aside from the levy screening, which is much more simplified, and so. They were willing to go and I think they were planning to do that. And then this risk assessment said, hey, maybe you don't spend the money there. Maybe you spend the money on these other things that are higher risk. Um, and they were working to improve the levy and bring it back up to, you know, a good standing with all the things that they had to do. So, yeah, it did. That was kind of the, the big success of it was being able to provide that to them if they still chose to do that, you know, that's on them to do, but we were able to kind of help inform them on that. Jess, I have one. Go ahead. Um, did you ever get any records from DOT? Were you successful? I don't think so. <laughs> they might have since, um, but I don't, I don't think we got very many um, from that. In this project, which is, I worked in the levy program for a while, and that was always a challenge for any DOT to get drawings, unless there was a state regulator who required it. Yeah. I see that um, in some of my projects. Uh, at higher level, there needs to be some communication between you says and DOT because they don't help. Yeah. They probably have boring logs and all sorts of data. They have a lot of information. Yeah. yeah, you would think we would share information a little bit better, but I think it's still a struggle. Yeah. I don't know about other states. I was in Maine before this. They had uh, vault plans archived online with the public. Okay. So you can go back to the 1920s. So well, that's good to know. Some other states. Okay. Yeah, I worked in New Hampshire. Um, and working on the levees, the core owned or core built levees and dams in New Hampshire, and the state regulates levees in New Hampshire, which is kind of rare. And um, they were really helpful because they required permits for the DOT and others to construct these. So when I didn't have it, I'd go to the state because we worked together pretty closely, and they'd gladly hand them over. But <laughs> it took a while to get there, but that's good to know. Thank you.